Welcome back, and we're now going to talk about part two, which is the risk indicators for periimplantitis. I'm just going to switch to the share screen. We'll start up with the presentation. Okay, so risk indicators, we're going to break them up by implant factors, the patient factors, the surgery and the site, the things you can do to create the problem, and prosthetics, which is how also you can increase your risk. So let's focus uh, also in, in general, what I want to say is that periimplantitis is something that uh, can and should be avoided. And often when I get a case referred, I can look at the case and say, predictably this would have failed because the following things were done wrong. So I want you to really pay attention to this section so that in your lifetime of your career, you don't end up with a lot of problems. So let's focus on the implant design. So there's something called a micro gap and that is the implant itself here and the abutment that connects either into it or on top of it. This is a platform design, so it's stepped in and a butt joint design would be directly here, but no matter what, there's a space there. And then we'll also talk about roughness, a machined implant or a roughened implant. So let's look at, look at roughening of the implant. So if we have a machined implant, what happens is when we put the implant in, the threads are holding the implant stable. Over time, in the first couple of weeks, the bone will die back from the trauma of the threads, compression, as well as the trauma from the surgery of the drilling. And we get a stability drop, so the implant becomes looser in bone. And in that time, though the bone is trying to form, it doesn't really reform till about two months later. So the old implants needed about three to four months of healing time before you could load them. If we roughen the surface up, the bone growth to the implant is quicker. And it's also better, we get more bone to implant contact. So we reduce that period when the implant might get knocked out during the initial healing. And we can also get to the case sooner as early as two or three weeks loading time. And certainly by four to six weeks, loading can be predictably done because you're well above the stability dip. So roughening of the implant is a current thing that is on all current market implants. So how rough is rough? Well, we have a machined implant, you still have some roughness. Modern design is what's called micro rough, and then the old designs of hydroxyapatite spray on was uh, very rough. And the ratio is something in the order of one and a half Mic uh, micron. So SA value of 1.2 to 1.5 is what's just defined as micro rough. And it turns out that that's the Goldilocks spot for bonding and getting your maximum bone to implant contact. The implants that you might be most familiar with, the Tyronite and the Strauman SLA, as well as the Astra, uh, they're all in that range of about 1.5, 1.2 .5, to 1.5. Now, does the advantage of that roughness that we like for getting bone to contact create a liability in terms of periimplantitis? And that was a good question. And we, we understood as early as 2008 that that was. This was a dog study where they put a ligature on the implant and then took the ligature off and let the disease spontaneously progress. And it became a standard model. Um, and they compared the different implant designs, machine versus Stroman, Tyronite, and Tyroblast from Astra. And what they have here is this before the ligament, after the ligament, and then beyond after spontaneous progression, just on the Stroman here, you can see how that progressed. Now this particular study found that BioCare Tyronite surface was worse, um, but only marginally so than the other rough implants. But one of the main findings of this study was that all of the rough surfaces did worse than titan the machine titanium. And one of the critiques of this study was that it used different implant shapes. So they repeat these studies and they do them now comparing the same design. So same implant, same design, only changing the roughness. And you can see the machined implant from the time of the ligature removal, which is your spontaneous period, had no bone loss compared to the Tyunite, which lost bone. And so that's important. And also Strauman uh, surface is the same. We have the, the ligature loss and the spontaneous actually almost improves as compared to the ligature 
ligature loss and then the spontaneous progression getting worse on the SLA. So I know that uh, Dr. Lung is one of your guys' instructors and he's, he's keen to point out that talionite is a bad surface because it's terrible and so on and so on. But the fact is they are both bad once that rough surface is exposed. And this has been brought, borne out by meta-analysis that should, looked at 87 studies where the implant design was the same, but the surface was rough versus machined. And always there's more bone loss on a rough surface. So whether it's Tyanite or SLA or any of them, all modern micro rough surfaces are a risk factor for periimplantitis if that gets exposed. And so Dennis Tarno, a famous uh, speaker, has said something to the effect that regarding papilla around implants, the issue is the tissue, but the bone sets the tone. And it's a really famous quote. I'd like to start a quote, and I want you to remember this, is get it in bone and keep it in bone. That means that that rough surface should be placed fully in bone when you're doing your surgery. And that means you need to know that you've achieved it and we'll find out whether that's possible. And if not, you need to graft. And keeping it in bone means designing your prosthesis properly and a few other things. We'll learn about that in the rest of the lecture. So that's the rough surface. What about the gap? So that micro gap creates something called a biologic width. So from the point of view of that connection, there's going to be a 1.5 millimeter drop to create a biologic width because bone doesn't want to be beside a bacteria. It will pull back. And that was been shown by Dr. Cochran's group. If we have a gap here, we always have 1.5 millimeters of loss when it's a butt joint connection. Now, what if I made the gap small enough? It was only 10 microns. Well, that had no effect. So it's not the size of the gap that matters. And even if we spot weld this so that it's not moving, yes, maybe a minor effect of reducing mobility, but still not significant. So the fact is, if you have a micro gap anywhere near the bone, the bone will move back to the create that biologic width. So that was, this was circa 1997, we knew this. And in the 2000s, BrioCare came out with something called the Groovy which is a butt joint connection. And they thought that if they roughened this up and make grooves that it would hold the bone, but it doesn't make any sense because the micro gap is, is, an, is a known phenomenon. And we know that we'll get one and a half millimeters of bone loss. And that means we know we're gonna get an exposed rough surface. And so when I was showing this implant, I told the rep, I will never place this implant because it's a dumb design. And in fact, that's what it looks like. This is a case I inherited. But you can see, again, that groove surface and the micro gap is here. You are going to guarantee, in fact, you can predictably get periimplantitis with this. And this particular implant design was very damaging to the company reputation. And they went from being the number one implant company in the world to being the number two implant company in the world. So you're going to say that's old technology. This is that, that loose fitting uh, friction design fit. It's um, it doesn't create a very good seal. I know Dr. Lung likes to say that it's a sloppy, dirty connection. And we're all smarter these days. We use a conical connection. And in theory, maybe that gives me a hermetic seal because it's such a tight fit here. And the answer is no, because if you take that fit and you load it, there's still microscopic mobility. And we know that over time, you know, if we compare, say, a Morris taper, which is going to be your tightest fitting conical connection you can get, uh, a pass-through design or even a trilobe, yes, we know the conical was better in terms of leakage, but all of them leak over time. So there's no such thing as a hermetic seal. Do not believe anybody that will tell you that. And there are implant companies that are suggesting that if you put this abutment in, connect it tightly and never ever move it or remove it, that you will guarantee a seal and a stay. It's not true. And we know that that leakage can happen as early as two weeks. And we know that the bacteria that are inside that space are associated with the bone loss. So uh, again, there's no such thing as a hermetic seal, even a conical connection or internal conical uh, pass through like this, they leak. What if you put chlorhexidine in? Uh, well, the fact is because there's a micro mobility, there's a pumping effect, it's gonna wash out. And there's been a study that showed no benefit in terms of reducing bacterial penetration. So don't waste your time. Now, we're gonna talk about standard platform versus platform shift. 
So a standard platform means the connection point is a butt joint. It's in line or flush fit. And we know from Cochrane's work that's guaranteed 1.5 millimeters of bone loss. But if I move that away horizontally, maybe I get less bone loss, but it depends. So for example, if I have a very small step in here, I'm still gonna get a millimeter of loss vertically. And if I step in further, even a half a millimeter, I'm still getting 0.8 millimeters of loss vertically. And even if I do a large inset on my platform shifting inlet inward, I'm still getting at least 0.6 millimeters. And we know in general, all platform shifts are prone to at least a half a millimeter of bone loss. And that's because this is laden with bacteria. All you've done is move it horizontally away from the bone, but it still has an impact on the bone. And it turns out no matter what design you look at, they looked at every design here, it's again, Dr. Cochran's group. And the only design that doesn't lose bone by the time you're at stage two is the one piece design. And that's where there is no gap at the level of the bone. So this is a machined collar. So it would look something like this, where the micro gap is now well away from the bone. It's moved to either two or three millimeters away from the bone. And that is the only design that doesn't lose bone from the time of placement to the time you do your prosthesis. So as I showed you in part one, my intervention rate was roughly double on the bone level designs because in part related to this inherent nature of having the bacteria close to the bone. Now there's other factors that come into play here because these cases are more often done in, in the anterior and also in bone grafting situations. So there's a confound on this data and I'm currently working through with my statistician, Dr. Ofik, to create a paper in this regard. But why would we want to use a platform shift implant? Well, the reason is many. We preserve the, uh, we move the horizontal gap, we move it horizontally, so we preserve some bone. We don't lose one and a half, we lose maybe 0.5 or 0.6. We also get better soft tissue volume because of this inset right here, there's more room for soft tissue. And because of that, we create these nice soft tissue contours. And we also, if we're using a platform shift, which is a conical fit, we're reducing that screw loosening risk. So there's many reasons to use it in the right application. It's also no longer a crime to do side-by-side -side implants. For example, here, as long as we place the implants properly, we can improve the aesthetic outcome and still maintain papilla uh, between two implants because we're not getting that horizontal loss going down one and a half millimeters. So again, there's a definitive advantage to platform shift implants. Uh, here's old school versus new school where we have the preservation of soft tissue and bone and we have the opposite effect here. And you can see the clinical outcome is obvious that the platform shift has an advantage. So platform conical connection are useful, but they are also um, really designed for anterior teeth. And there's a trend in the marketplace right now that everybody is placing them everywhere. In fact, they only have one implant in the drawer and that makes no sense because really an anterior case is very different than a posterior case. And here's an example. Why would you do this? You have to develop a contour, which is very hard to develop compared to being built into the implant. So you have to plan your depth of placement. You can see they didn't place this implant deep enough to allow emergence. You have a weaker abutment. If you think about the width of this system, it's about six millimeters across. This is about three. There's no way those two things are the same strength. You've also got a very thin implant wall here, and these have been known to break the implant wall open because the conical connection is creating that wedging effect. And if you have a molar with high forces and a very thin implant wall, you can break the implant. And obviously we create an overhang or periimplantitis risk here. So I don't use platform shift in molars unless for some reason, like I'm perhaps having to graft and bury the implant. And I think that the marketplace is wrong. When you go to start and buy your practice or start up your implant practice, if you're an associate, be sure to have two implant designs that you get familiar with. The tissue level design for posterior sites and the platform shift conicals for the anterior sites. 
Let's talk about the patient then. We'll move on from implants to patients. We have a proven risk factor in smoking, diabetes, and perio. So that's where the data and the literature is very strong. We have some weaker data for things like steroid, bisphosphonate, proton pump inhibitor, and SSRI. I will not have time to go into all of these. I'll focus on that one only. But smoking is really one of the most important things. We know, and this is a study that we had published looking at the impact of smoking over time. It was up to 10 year study and we considered only heavy smokers. We just kind of pooled the light smokers in with non-smokers. Early data showed that there's no change in bone loss from time of placement to stage two. You're the same as a non-smoker. So the implant healed and the bone took. But over time, we see more bone loss. And not only do we see more bone loss, we see the rate increasing. So the slope increases. And that means my problems become more and more and more over time. And I'm not the only person that found that. CAM has also shown that over time, about a third of the implants have lost uh, more than a millimeter of bone. So you can place implants in smokers and you will be successful in the first few years, but you have to realize and they have to realize that they will get periimplantitis at a much higher rate. And that needs to be part of your informed consent or better yet, you work very hard to get them down to either non-smoking or light smoking. And here's a case that really shows it graphically. Looking at this molar here, you can see that we were in very good bone volume here. There was at least two or three millimeters of buccal bone thickness. And we used a tissue level design, but here's my aha moment. When you look at this x-ray, it's fine, but this is a case you saw in part one, where the bone loss literally just melted back. And we did not have a separation or an infection time here. It was simply the atrophy of the bone caused by the microvascularity damage from smoking and everything else going on in this case. And we're gonna lose all of the implants on this case at some point over time because the smoking hasn't stopped. I mean, this is someone who smokes almost two packs a day. What about diabetes? Well, if it's uncontrolled diabetes, first of all, you shouldn't be doing implants. You have to understand that's an ASA4. But if it's um, developing after, we do know that it does reduce bone volume. It, it impairs wound healing. So absolutely no treatment for someone who's uncontrolled. But a controlled diabetic, in fact, if you look at a risk ratio of 1.07, it's the same. It's almost like a one times one equals one. So there's no real risk factor as far as the implant failure. And there's a very small impact on peri-implant bone loss. So diabetes is important in that you recognize how well it's controlled and you focus on that with your patient. But you can go ahead and treat controlled diabetics. Periodontal disease is the other big one. So we have smoking as a major factor and periodontal disease is the next one. Now, Carusis' study was a 10-year study. And as I mentioned before, you need long-term data to find out about periimplantitis. So what they looked at was patients with a periodontal disease history versus those without. And they found a five times more incidence of periimplantitis when you have a history of periodontal disease. And we know that the teeth themselves, the bacteria that we can culture here, end up culturing there and there's the same serotype. So it's important that you understand that, that if you have periodontal disease, you need to treat it before you do the implant work. Let's take a look at a large retrospective study, Dirk's study on, on 2000 implants followed over again, nine year follow-up. And they found about 14% of patients had periimplantitis with about three to four millimeters of bone loss in these moderate to advanced cases. And it turned out that having a history of periodontal disease made a ratio of four times risk. So that's about the same as carusis. So when you're talking to your patient and they have periodontal disease and you're gonna replace that failed molar with an implant now, they should be aware that their risk of developing periimplantitis is four to five times that of a healthy patient. By the way, Dirks also found that if you're doing multiple implants, say, for example, re replacing full arches or, you know, say three or four implants, uh, you know, semi sections of an arch, um, your is risk is 15 times higher. And that makes sense because you're dealing with a patient who's probably compromised in other ways. That's why they lost so many teeth. As well, they interestingly found that general dentists that are placing the implants had a four times risk factor for periimplantitis. Now we'll talk about that later in surgical risk factors.
and just keep that in mind, what's being done wrong. Interestingly as well, they compared brands and they found that all the brands other than Strauman had about a three to five times risk for pairing plantitis. But this is an old study. The, the study was published in 2016, but it was finished in 2012. And the brand Strauman at the time had only the tissue level design. So it didn't have a bone level implant. So it was before 2008. Um, and so really what we're comparing here is the effect of a tissue level implant where the gap is well above versus all these designs that are bone level designed. So again, that just supports what we've already shown you earlier. So here's a case that is basically the perfect storm. We have a patient with a periodontal disease history who required more than four implants because it was done as a full arch case. And they were some non strauman design with a rough threaded area right up to the gap. And you could predictably get failure. And this is what we end up having to do with these cases. So we start with this aggressive bone loss and grind away on the titanium and level this off and we get a stable outcome. But this is not a happy event for me or anybody to deal with. And if we look at the risk that this case inherited, there was a four times risk factor with, with the periodontal disease history, a 15 times risk for the multi-site case, and a four times risk for this non-tissue level design, which in theory adds up to a 21 times risk. Now, statisticians right now are freaking out because you can't actually add risk like that. But just mentally, when you're treatment planning your cases, I want you to think of numbers like that. And so that when you go to take this case on, just realize that you're 20 times more likely to fail. We also have to differentiate the type of periodontal disease is chronic versus aggressive. So this was a study by uh, Flores de Jacob and they basically showed in a patient who was on recalls, rapid progressive versus chronic perio, which ones developed more periimplantitis and they found that there was more bone loss in these aggressive perio cases about 14 times greater. Now, today we don't call them generalized aggressive, we call them grade C rapid or something like that. You know, that's part of what you're learning at dental school. But just remember to differentiate rapid progressive cases versus chronic. If you have a couple of six millimeter pockets in someone who doesn't have great oral hygiene, and they're age 50, you're not too concerned. But if you have multiple separating, you know, six, eight millimeter pockets in someone who's mid thirties, a whole different animal. And here's my example then. This is basically my worst case ever. So this was a case that's referred to me from a periodontist. That's never a good sign. If a perio is sending you your cases, it's kind of like, here, you take it. So we were age 34 with her and she had already been losing many teeth. We were at the stage where we were going to lose all of her maxillary teeth, despite everything we were doing with our home care and, and recall cleaning. The bottom bicuspid to bicuspid was in pretty good shape. Uh, I had the discussion with her that we should take all of her teeth out be and because the idea would be that we could remove the pathogens. But it's a pretty tough thing to do to someone who's 30 to take all of the teeth out, especially lower dentures aren't so comfortable as upper. So we discussed it and we chose to compromise and keep the bicuspid to bicuspid on the lower arch. So keeping the lower anterior arch. And this is what we had as our outcome. You can see the tissue inflammation and you can see progressive bone loss. All of this happened within about the first six months. We're trying to save the implant here doing citric decontamination and it didn't work. And it continued to fail and causing bone sequestrum and you'd think that patient would have left me, but they didn't because we had explained everything in the beginning that we were all taking that risk. But by the way, before we did the implants, we did microbial testing of the lower teeth and we followed and maintained her for a year. And only then did we proceed with the implants, but we were still fooled because the pathogens were still present. So even microbial testing is not always valid. Nonetheless, what happens eventually is the lower anterior teeth did progress and did lose bone and we lost them. So now we have a fully edentulous patient, which we kept edentulous for a year with the partial denture, but because the maxilla was so damaged, there was not very much retention. So we said, let's try the implants again. And we did a sinus lift bilaterally to get enough bone. Obviously couldn't place it here because there was no ridge. We built dual bars and a bar on the bottom 
and the tissue is healthy, the bone is healthy, you can see very good outcome here, even up to one year and two year follow up now. So that's been established in the literature. I think that's kind of an important moment for you guys to recognize that if you have an aggressive profile bacteria case, then full extraction is a consideration because we know that removing the bacteria, or removing the teeth, remove the pathogens. So this is a case here. We did another one just subsequently very much like it. So it's um, well established, but I'm not telling you to take all the teeth out whenever you see somebody with perio. Um, instead, what you might do is do bridges on teeth, even if you know that you're gonna lose them in 10 years, because you don't wanna start doing implants until everything is failing and then you move on to implants. So there's a lot of times where I'll say to a dental office to bridge from a 1.4 to a 1.7, and the 1.7 has a class two frication with seven millimeter pocket, and they're gonna be like, are you crazy? It's like, no, I don't wanna do an implant because that would be crazy. Do the bridge, we'll buy five or 10 years when the other teeth fail because that's the kind of patient it is, then we'll do full clearance and then we'll do the implants. But this begs the question about teeth in a day. Should I take teeth out and put implants in the very same day if I'm dealing with, a, with an aggressive perio case? And the answer is no because you're putting it into that same environment. So again, just one more thing that you wanna be careful of the trend in the marketplace. Do I take teeth out all the time though? Well, here's a case that is a rapid progressive. You can see the classic shape of defect on the first molar and the anterior teeth. This was a juvenile perio case back in the day. And we took out the failing teeth. We did aggressive microbial treatment and then we maintained the case for three years before we considered our first implant. At the time, it was 1997, we were dealing with machined implants. And then by 2000, we're dealing with Strauman surfaced implants. And by having three year follow up and maintaining his case periodontally, um, we were able to go on to have a 20 year outcome that with a good outcome on the implant stability. Uh, again, older style, we have aesthetic issues, but certainly no, no attachment loss and no failures. So again, we don't always take teeth out and we don't, we, we sometimes will place implants in patients with perio history, but you must manage the perio first. So let's move on from periodontal disease to immunocompromised. So we did publish a study early on of survival, which is the loss of the implant that showed a nine times risk of failure if patients are on chronic steroids or have other autoimmune conditions like, like um, autoimmune hepatitis or or celiac disease and those kinds of things. Now, that was a borderline significant because of small numbers of cases, but this is an example of one. The implants were perfectly healthy and you can see the amount of bone loss that we have here. And that was someone who developed a sudden autoimmune condition. And I mean, their whole body crashes and of course, so is this gonna happen. And also steroids, we know they cause immune uh, suppression. We also know that they have an osteopenic effect on the bone. So we look also then at the, the impact on periimplantitis, which of course you can see being well-established here. Um, and we know that when we first put the implant in, there's no effect, it's kind of like smoking, but over time, the steroid or the autoimmune condition increases our bone loss over time. So if you wanted to have a high rate of failure, what you might do is a multi-implant case in a smoker who also had perio disease and is immunocompromised. That would be kind of your best case to refer to your worst enemy, for example. So now let's take a look at the things that we can do as clinician to make this problem worse. So we do bone graft. Sometimes we have to bone graft. If we have a narrow ridge like here, we will place the implant and whatever residual defect we have, we will bone graft. If it's a large defect out of the contour of the bone, we'll use a Gore-Tex. If it's a small defect, we'll use a collagen. And this is a standard protocol for me, 50-50 autogenous with Xeno HA. And, and we've established that protocol. And because we use the same technique over the past 15 years or 20 years, we can have data on it. And so when I look at my outcomes right away, even in the first stage at, at stage two, we have a little bit more bone loss. And it's not surprising because under the membrane is an area of collagen that you never get bone right to the membrane. So you always start 
with about a quarter millimeter less bone, but then over time, we see that bone increasing over time. And by the time we get to eight years, we have about two millimeters of bone loss on average. That's quite a bit in a bone grafted site. And I'm not the only person who finds this. Shada just recently in 2019 showed two and a half times risk if you have done a bone graft for periimplantitis. And especially that risk is greater if there's adjacent implants. So what we want to do then is limit bone grafting as much as possible. So we often will do smaller implant dimensions or shorter implants, join them together to try to manage anything we can do to reduce a bone graft. And you could say, well, I don't do a lot of bone grafting because I socket graft. But the question is, is a socket graft a bone graft? And the answer is yes, don't kid yourself. A socket graft is a bone graft by definition. And so yes, it preserves the dimension, so you may not need to graft at the time of placement, but it adds cost to every case. And the long-term is unknown because we don't know what it, what does it actually form bone? Does the bone stay and does it actually take load? And I say that because the data shows that there's really no long-term studies. Most of them are less than one year. Most of them are case reports, but of the random control trials, there's only one that is a three-year study. And when we tell about patients getting implants, we say this implant should be good for 20 or 30 years, but we don't have any evidence of that if we're doing a socket graft. There is a benefit. We know that we gain one and a half, or rather preserve one and a half millimeters of bone. So if I take the tooth out, I don't get as much of this loss. But I'm gonna show you what my opinion is on that in a second. Uh, we, we do know that this, so there's no data for long-term consequences, and that's the biggest question. So this is my opinion. The implant on the left is almost completely in grafted bone. The implant on the right is almost completely in native bone, except I lost one and a half millimeters, so I'm going to gain that little bit back. Now, if my graft fails me, I end up losing a couple of millimeters. If my graft fails me here, I lose the whole thing. That's my opinion and I'll show you some cases. Here is a xenograft, so that's a bio type material with a collagen barrier, and we get what the F, let's say WTF, and you guys all know what WTF means. It means what the fuzz, and when you see this on an x-ray, you know right away that's not real bone, because it doesn't look like real bone, and when you drill into it, you can see the particles here. You can see them flaking away. Now, this is okay, because I can bone graft that, and I do, but that costs me or the patient, somebody has to pay again. Um, and that has to be built into your planning if you're gonna do it. But what if I was doing a flapless surgery? What if I was one of those guys that was leading edge uh, where I was like socket grafting everything because I thought that was a good idea. And then I was doing a guided flapless procedure everywhere because that's also a good idea. I would never even know that I had this problem until five years later when I see a ton of bone loss. So, you're gonna to say to me, well, yeah, but HA is a bad material. And I would agree, you can see this here, 48 months later, it doesn't resorb. It's just ceramic, it doesn't go anywhere. And here's an example. You had this, a case we inherited where the implants were put into a socket graft. And you can see where the bone falls away till, till it hits native bone. Because that particle, when you have that ceramic that's in bone, when the native bone dissolves, all you have is a foreign object now and it's contaminated with bacteria and it flakes out. So I've seen a lot of these because there was a few clinicians in my neighborhood that were doing a ton of these cases and this is what they all look like at five years. So you're gonna say, well, that's old material. Let's, what about allograft, the combination min de min? And, and that is for sure shown to be the best. Brian Mealy has said that that is the material to use and he's done the more histology than anybody on this. So we did that and you can see a thin buccal crest. We thought, let's preserve the ridge. And again, you can say what the fuzz, because I do see a difference in the appearance, but we did get good width. But that what the fuzz, when we go clinically and open that up, even with six months of healing, is mush. And I can tell you sometimes it's hard and sometimes it isn't, but what you're getting here is epithelial migration down to the graft and you're not getting bone all the way up to the crest. And again, if I'm putting an implant in there, how do I know that's gonna be real bone and will it take load? I don't know. And we know that those residual particles remain even in these min d min combination. And those particles are as big as one millimeter in some cases. 20% of cases have residual particles. 
where 20% of the graft is residual particle. And I got this picture from Greg Steiner because he had contacted me when he read our paper on perimplantitis and he said, your numbers are too low. I don't trust your data. And he asked me, what are you doing for your procedure? And I explained to him that we're doing mature ridges. So we extract weight and place the implant to a mature ridge in about 80 or 90% of cases. And he goes, okay, that makes sense. Cause if you're not socket grafting, then I believe you. Then he, then he said, then he went on to send me these pictures and he's got some other reports on this, but this was a case that was grafted with a combination of min mineralized allograft and xenograft and then failed eventually to periimplantitis and later on mobility. But you can see here clearly that there's particles that are still present 10 years later. And histologically, those particles are present, the allograft, the bioos. So the question is, do we really need to bone graft a socket? Like, why are we socket grafting? First of all, I've told you there's no long-term data. Just because people are on the lecture circuit telling you to do it doesn't mean it's right. So here is my own case example then. This is a friend of mine. He works on my car with me. This is an old Alfa Romeo. And Alfa Romeos are famous for breaking down. So I need my friend to help me. I want to make sure he stays my friend. So that's his situation. We had a failing bicuspid and a leaking uh, fractured bicuspid or failing molar and a leaking bicuspid. Even despite the thin buccal crest, I chose not to socket graft. That saves me time because I don't need an extra three months. I can go right in at three months for the surgery now. I can, autogenous bone means I don't need a bone graft, so I save money and I save sleep because there's no long-term uncertainty. And you're gonna say, yeah, but you must have done something. No, look, that ridge is nice and wide and plenty wide for the implant. So it's real bone with adequate width and height. And that's a case report. And I told you I like numbers, but let's look at numbers then. Brian Mealy, who happens to have published more on this area than anybody, has done one of the best studies on this. He took that ridge preservation with or without, and he built a stent so he could actually reference the crest and before and after measurement, accurately define what's happening. And what they found was, yes, we do lose one and a half millimeters of height in a molar. But on a molar ridge, you don't lose any difference in width. So both of them lose some bone, but no difference if you graft a ridge or not, if you're talking about doing a molar extraction. So what about if they had to bone graft again? Well, it turns out that if they don't graft, about one in four, they ended up needing a graft. So when you do an extraction on a molar, one in four, you may need to graft. If you do an extraction and socket graft, just one in 10, you still have to bone graft. So you're still bone grafting at least 10% of your sites twice. But what that means is at least 100% of them have an uncertain future. And this is the issue for me. By the way, that 1.5 millimeters loss is not a big deal. It's actually favorable because if we look here, we often will have to put the implant in. We know there's a 2.8 millimeter collar. We have about three or four millimeters needed for the, for the abutment and then two or three or two millimeters for the material thickness. So we end up needing vertical space. And more often than not, when I'm doing a molar, I have to cut the ridge back a little bit to create vertical clearance. So the vertical is not a big deal. But what about anterior teeth? Yes, the ridge collapses and often you'll get this dehiscence-like defect. And here we do have a small dehiscence, one or two millimeters. But tell me, look at that implant. It is mostly in native bone. And I have a very small, very easily managed defect here. As well, I have a contour con problem here. I'm gonna build that out with autogenous and bioos. In this case, the xenograft is gonna be favorable because it's going to give us that volume maintenance we're looking for. The, the fact that it doesn't resorb is actually a good thing in this situation because we get the volume contour that we need. But the implant is almost 99% in real bone. So I call this veneer grafting or minor augmentation. And how often do we do that? If I look at anterior and posterior teeth, it works out to 30% of the time I need a bone graft, which means if I was socket grafting, I would be socket grafting 70% of cases that didn't need it in the first place. So 70% of your cases don't need a bone graft. And here's an example, perfectly good molar, well the molar was failed and we took it out. Now this was a dental assistant who actually came to us. She works in two different clinics and they were gonna take care of it, but they were gonna do a socket graft. And she came to us because she knew we didn't.
look at the width. We have no issue for width and height. By the way, we graphed 30% of sites, including anterior posterior. Mealy found 25% needed a graft in posterior. So in general, you know, a quarter to a third of your cases may need a bone graft. And that means 60 to 70% of your cases are going to be better off because they don't need a bone graft, didn't have it, and that means their success rates are going to be better long term. What about keratinized tissue, this thick keratinized band that we like to have? Do we need it? It's a solid maybe. Systematic review shows if you've got uh, inadequate or adequate, basically you do have no difference in bone loss if you have good oral hygiene, but if you have poor oral hygiene, then it does make a difference. So it's beneficial if someone's not compliant, but also it makes it easier to do oral hygiene because it's more comfortable. So in general, it's a good idea, but is it always worth the additional cost? And the answer is a solid maybe. But there's one place where it is important, and that's a platform shift design implant. And that's because this biologic width, which we talked about, is going to be created. And if your tissue is very thin, that biologic width, instead of being created at the level of the tissue, is created at the level of the bone. And Likovicius has shown that you do get more bone loss if you have thin tissue on a platform shift design. So here's a case example of a thin keratinized tissue, and we see it was healthy at one point but started to develop some bone loss around here. We did a, a, a gingival augmentation, and even just having done that, we got improvement in the quality of the bone. So do we graft every case? No, and it becomes something that's a decision factor. So again, a, a solid maybe, but if you're doing platform shifts in those narrow posterior ridges, then maybe you should be doing the grafting as well. What about the bite? So there's a case at stage two, and at one year, we can see this cupping effect. Now, there was no bleeding, no inflection. So this was not a disease-driven problem. This was a load problem. And I'm going to show you we fixed it. You can see before and after. And what did he do? All I did was adjust the bite, took it out of the bite. And you can see the bone came back in. Now, that's a good example, but how do we know if occlusion is a, fa a factor? Well, we can take a look at a monkey study. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at oral hygiene, yes, oral hygiene, no, and put the crown in hyperocclusion, either 0.1 or 0.2. And what we find is if you're in hyperocclusion, even a healthy claimed case, 0.2 millimeters leads to bone loss. But if you have hyperocclusion, a 0.1 and inflammation, you get bone loss. So the, basically the plaque is doubling your risk factor. And you're going to say, well, I don't put my crowns in hyperocclusion. I'm going to say, yes, you do. Here's why, because healthy teeth move, teeth intrude. So a, a mandibular molar in a perfectly functional healthy case is gonna intrude 30 microns. In a parafunctional patient in a maxillary molar, it's gonna intrude 136 microns, which by the way, if we have plaque present, is more than enough to cause bone loss. So we typically always try to achieve at least a 30 micron clearance in healthy situations and we double that up. So we do it this way. Acufilm is 20 microns. So imagine this piece of paper with an acufilm. If I fold it once, I have a 40 micron clearance. And I like that to pull through when the patient is biting. And if it's a Bruxer, I'm going to go to 80 microns, which is a double fold. And it's just a really quick and easy way to dial in your occlusion. So you don't have that intrusion of the adjacent teeth causing hyper occlusion on your implant. What about human factors? Well, this one hospital study showed that, you know, three out of four failures were coming from the same surgical teams, which tells you, you got a problem with your person, not, not your clinic. And, and it comes down to tech, you know, tech, uh, practitioner attitude, not technical considerations. And, and to be fair enough, we all learn, and we know that inexperience doubles your risk. If you're only doing 50 implants a year, you're probably gonna fail twice as often as someone who's doing more. But, you know, with time, you get experience. But very interesting study by Yemp's group, and this is Gothenburg. It looked at the very original implants, uh, Bronemark, 39,000 implants, so massive study. And they found differences between the surgeons. As expected, more failure in the early learning curve. But more importantly, a few surgeons, three in particular, stood out with the highest failure rates and accounted for many of the failures when deviating and taking risk so uh, what they're saying is that the attitude makes a difference 
and that they tend to overestimate their ability on complex procedures. And, you know, we're going to talk about that study by, by Dirks that said general dentists placing implants have four times more failures. This is part of it, you know, getting on high risk procedures without understanding what you're getting into. And so the Journal of American Dental Association, which is a journal for general dentists and by general dentists looked at this. They took 87 experienced practitioners. That means they had to do 100 implants a year and restore them as well, place and restore. And their outcome was lower than academic or specialist. And, and if we look at peri-implantitis only, we had 18% that had lost over two millimeters by the four year point. Now, that's a lot. Um, that means almost one in five is a future liability because that rough surface is exposed. If you compare that to our outcome at seven years, we have a 5%. So they're roughly three times the amount of loss in about half the time. So that's where periimplantitis is becoming a problem. That's why I'm seeing so many more referrals for it in my practice. So what are the things that the general dentists or even other dentists, myself included, are doing wrong in some cases? Well, it comes down to proximity, depth, compression, and malposition. These are the main ones. I'm going to show you a case here that did everything wrong. They're too close together, they're at different heights, they're malposed, and they used a hypercompression implant. So it would be almost comical when we look at that and say, well, who could do that? But here's the reality, this is the outcome for this patient that was a young, mid-30s, high smile line, who has now an arch that is completely impossible to repair. So let's look at proximity. When implants are placed side by side, you need absolutely to have three millimeters of bone between them. And so the average implant dimension being about uh, three and a half to four and a half millimeters, it works out to roughly seven millimeters from this point to that point. If you use six and a half to seven as a standard, you'll never get yourself into trouble. If you use a platform shift, remember this is because of this 1.5 millimeters of loss, which we know happens. And we know there's a halo of that. It's not just vertical, it goes all the way around. So you could say maybe a platform shift I need less. That's true, but by how much we don't know. Um, so two and a half millimeters maybe in a some, certain situations, but certainly you don't want to do this. Uh, even though that's a platform shift, it's still too close. But this was a case where the implants were half price, so the guy did twice as many. Um, so it's just bad, bad dentistry. What about placing too deep? Now, here we see the implant is quite deep. It's placed certainly it's far too deep. That's a situation probably where the, the surgeon didn't know how to bone graft, so just kept going until the implant was in bone. What it creates isn't peri-implantitis, because there's no bone loss here, but it does create a deep pocket, which is a risk factor. So it's not disease, it's just a risk. And here's an example again, too deep and too far back, create an overhang that's impossible. This was very painful for the patient to try and maintain, so we ended up taking the implant out. What about too shallow? Well, if we look at the bone crest here, you can see the crest of the bone would have been something like that. This implant was never really in bone. And not only was it too shallow that it exposes the rough surface, it creates this impossible contour. And they did that because probably they only had one implant dimension ordered that day. They realized they got close to the nerve, so they stopped right there. Now, if you're doing implants, you have to have more than one size available. You, you have to plan better than that. What about adjacent implants? Well, here's a case where these implants were a little bit close together, but more important than their proximity is their difference in height. And I'll tell you, this is my case. This is early in the days of bone level design and the concept of the bone loss from the platform connection wasn't well understood. But this implant pulled the bone down because it's a differential height and we know there's a halo effect and it's pulling the bone down on that tooth there. So be careful, especially when you're doing adjacent implants to match the height of the platform. And malposition is probably the elephant in the room. This is the one that matters most. It's a big tendency here. You can see the ridge is there, the outline of the buccal crest and the implants practically out of it. This was an immediate implant placed in a socket where they placed it in the socket instead of into the palatal wall. That's a mistake. And it's the kind of thing that we call a learning curve tendency where implants are placed and they're too far to the buccal. But more importantly, if it is buccal like here, and yes, it's kind of in bone, 
if you don't graph that, it will disappear. And this is a Alberta Monnier's group that showed that right here, that, that implant started in bone, but ended up down here. And so that's where you need to kind of understand that you have thin bone and graft it. Um, and you need to be able to know that you got 1.5 millimeters, but that means you need to see it. So what if you're doing flapless surgery? Well, this is what you are with flapless surgery. You have no idea what you've got. You have a computer idea, but you don't know. And we know that the guide positioning is often, you know, a problem. Implant stability is not always predictable and grafting, whether you need to do it or not, is never realized. So you got to raise a flap and take a peek and see what your liability is because you will end up with bone loss years down the road. I, I teach implant surgery and, and um, one of the cases, one of the clinicians I was teaching, I asked him how he's doing and he says, why are you in the course? And he said, well, I'm, I'm getting a lot of bone loss on my implants. All of them have about three or four millimeters after the first few years. And we got to talking and I realized he was doing flapless guided surgery. And I said, well, there's your problem. You know, you don't know your liability until it shows up four years later. So why is that? Well, if you have a guide, if you're fully edentulous, your air is up to three millimeters. Um, it's not your average that matters, it's your bad day. And that's the case that ends up in court. Um, what about a partially edentulous? Because that's more accurate, you're putting it on a tooth. 2019 study, so modern technology, co-diagnostic, Strauman's best system, tooth supported guide, CBCT with oral scanning combined, still the worst day is 1.5 millimeters off. That's a substantial amount of exposed implant. And so if you are going to do flapless, try to, as much as you can, even retain a tooth to try and improve your stent seating. Not, not, not flapless, guided rather. If you're doing guided, please retain some teeth and put windows in your guide so you can seat it. But if you're doing a guide, always, always raise a flap after, even if you don't raise a flap before and take a look because 59% of the time you'll find you have a dehiscence. And we know that the success rate, if you don't raise a flap and verify, is lower. And complications happen. We know that guides don't fit or they break or there's learning curve issues. And the implant, more often than not, 74% of the time, if the stent doesn't seat fully, then your implant isn't placed deep enough. And unless you raise a flap, you don't get a chance to see that. So please raise a flap, even if it's a couple millimeters. What about fads and trends in surgery? Well, it comes around, you go to different lecture circuits and one year everybody's talking about this, socket shield, which is retaining a bit of a root so that we don't get resorption later on and maybe recession or immediate implant in a molar that this is four millimeters of horizontal defect and that doesn't fill in with bone, you graft it. And so the entire implant is sitting in grafted bone. You know what I think about that or high insertion torque implants. That was the big thing in the 2008, rather. So what I say to this is call me in five or 10 years because your problems, that's when they show up. Um, otherwise practice for a few years and move town. Let's look at the big trend in the market for the past 10 years was this high insertion torque because everybody wants to do immediate loading. If you jam the implant in tighter, maybe you can immediate load safer. They said up to 70 to 170 Newtons was the same as 30 to 50. And this study is bad. It's often quoted, but it's a bad study. Non-random, non-blind, no histology. The control was tiny compared to the high torque group. They only report average data. They don't look at outliers. Now outliers are where you learn. Those are where, that's the, remember we showed you the five to 15% that I have failures on? That's where you do your learning. They don't report it, they report average. But if you read the paper, the two that had complications were in the high torque group. And in the discussion section, but nowhere in the, in the results or in the abstract was that they had nine times more bone loss from stage two to one year in the high torque group. And this has also been supported by Cochrane's group where they took a bone level, Strauman bone level, so a very mild tapered design and did a tap or no tap. And in the absence of a tap, they had more crustal bone loss and it was statistically significant. So again, you want to minimize any crustal compression because you don't want to encourage even a millimeter or two of early bone loss. Because what is that? That's exposing rough surface. And remember what we say, get it in bone and keep it in bone. My experience with the high torque implant was this. We only did 76 of them, 
we were in a, a pre-market trial for the Nobel Active and we stopped because of this kind of outcome. And again, immediate placement in infected sockets, another trend on the market case. This is a systematic review, but look, it's 21 case series. That is not evidence-based. That is simply storytelling. And if what we can conclude in this paper, they conclude that controlled trials are needed and more importantly, we need over five-year follow-up to establish whether these are proper treatment protocols. So let's look at the implant prosthetic now and see what we can do to make things worse for ourselves. And we'll break it up into these four categories. So obviously this is a great example of very poor management of cement. And in part, it showed up six years later because the patient never came back for follow-up. So we see separation and we see obviously bone loss, but if we clean the cement off and we did a treatment, which I'll show you in the next lecture, we got very good outcome and a stable case. But how can we get there? So the question is, at what level do you cement? Where do you put your margin? Linkovicious again showed that if you put the margin at a zero, one, two, or three sub G, what do we get? Well, he used a resin cement, very thin layer, and he was an experienced prosthodontist removing the cement. So, you know, the best case scenario. And what he found is that only this at the tissue level could he remove the cement. All of these, even one millimeter, had some residual, which of course got worse the, the deeper you go. But freakishly, even the cement would get into the tissue itself, creating what would be a granulomatous response over time. So clearly cementation subgingivally is difficult. So you want to have your margins where perhaps facially it's subgingival one millimeter, but the rest of the contour should come up and you need to really work your lab because labs are lazy and they do a circumferential margin. You need to tell them proximal and palatal, it must be above the gum line. And otherwise you have this, you can see, you know, this is proximally, this is a palatal margin with subgingival cement. We don't even need a palatal margin subgingivally. That should have been at the level of the gum line. And this is impossible to detect on an X-ray and very difficult to detect with a probe. And it's a ticking time bomb because we know from Wilson's work that these problems increase over time. They show up five and 10 years later. It's even made worse by platform shift design. So again, we like platform shift for anterior aesthetic cases, and that's usually where we have angle problems, so we end up cementing. But just like water adheres to this fountain, cement loves to adhere to this abutment and follow the line. And it goes down to the neck of the implant, and the tissue is healthy, even for the first five or six years. You can see I'm probing. There's no way I can get down to that cement without raising a flap. And yet I have to do that because if I leave this, I know it will fail. So what type of cement do we use then? We, we could use temp bond, but it's basically too weak for anything other than a multiple unit case. And this was a study on a solid abutment. So they standardized the abutment. Zinc phosphate is good. And then I would say this is everything else you do not use. First of all, we don't need such retention, but more importantly, these are non-dissolving cements that are even in some cases bonding to the implant surface and you will never get them off. So zinc phosphate is your best choice, partly because we know it dissolves. That's the problem with a crown on a tooth is that it dissolves and it gets decay, but you're not gonna get decay in an implant. So dissolution is your friend because a little bit of cement under the gum, if it's there, may dissolve, but also it is antimicrobial. In a Petri dish, it's fully clear. Uh, Temporary bond also has some antimicrobial properties, but the resin cements are the worst. They are like a Petri dish for bacterial growth. So zinc phosphate is what you want to use. You want to use a thin layer and preferably don't fill in your access hole. So there's some reservoir for that cement to fill into. That's going to reduce how much exudes out your margin and ideally even put a second hole here so the flow runs easier. Just like if you pour a pot bottle upside down, it doesn't run easily. And this is all the work of Dr. Wadwani. Um, if you ever want to see a good lecture on cement, he is the master on this topic. But the real solution for cementitis is to go to screw-retained solutions. And especially because we now have angle-corrected systems, 
we can work those anterior cases better with most cases being cementless. Now, what about the actual abutment design? So we like a platform shift because we get to maintain all this soft tissue and create a good aesthetic outcome. But all that is lost if we go and not pay attention to the abutment design. Here's a case where a stock abutment was used because the lab just did it and the dentist said, I don't know, give me an abutment. And you can see this is actually compressing on the bone. Guaranteed bone loss. So what do we have to do? We took this abutment off and had the dentist remake it. It's not a practice builder to do that. And again, sometimes even in the absence of gross error, there's this situation where a vario base or a titanium base was used so that they could go as zirconia. That's all good and well, but look at the outcome. It's over contoured and we get a very bad outcome. In, in narrow cases like this, oftentimes the prefabricated abutment, the built-in emergence right here, is difficult to manage. And so sometimes you actually might want to use a zirconia implant or abutment right into the implant. And I know some people say you should never do that because they break. We actually did publish a paper on that and found that the Strauman system didn't break, but the Astra system, the Atlantis did. We had 15 to 17% breakage compared to a zero to 1% with the other designs. So, you know, again, I don't use a lot of zirconia abutments directly to fixtures because of this solution is a bit better strength wise, but still rather than create over contour, this is a better solution. And what about creating overhangs? Well, if you have overhangs or uncleansable areas, then Sereno and Strum have shown that you can predictably get bone loss at 65% of cases, as opposed to if you have good oral hygiene, you have 80% predictability of a healthy implant. So absolutely, this accessibility for cleaning and getting the is required. Now, that brings me to this concept of the all on four and the pro arch, the big trend in the marketplace still. It's a good idea because we're joining the implants together. We don't have teeth anymore, so we lose the peri-implantitis risk. Very similar to the original design, but it's so badly implemented in the market, it's gonna give us a lot of trouble because most people are not planning the transition line. Even this picture here is done wrong. I took some pictures from the web of some very wonderful, happy clinics, and their, their work shows that they think they're very happy with it, but in fact, I look at this and say, that's a failure. There's an impossible cleansability here. Here again, impossible. Look at the size of the overhangs going buccal and lingual on these cases. It's about eight or nine millimeters. And if you have this situation where you have all on four with uncleansability, you'll end up with all on floor. And why does it happen? Well, here is what you need to do. Develop room for material thickness and room to hide the transition line from when the lift moves. And you need to calculate this in advance. Most people, take the teeth out and put the implant in at the level of the crest or something like it. They're, they don't plan to know what they need and they end up creating this. I'll show you how to do it though, is using digital design and you have to also include the transition line of the lip movement, so some kind of facial marking as well. Um, this is courtesy of Sonia, this picture on the design planning. Here's a case though where we did where it converted after the fact. So this was a bar and it was healthy for about 10 years. And then the dentist said, I might want to convert this because the patient said, I want to go teeth instead of a denture. So healthy, healthy for 10 years. And all of a sudden I get a phone call saying, we got a problem. We got bone loss on the implants and we look at this and it's a big mess. And what happened was they went to a fixed prosthesis on a case that was never never designed to be there so we created this overhang and if you look at it it's completely uncleansable situation and just the conversion of that led to the problem so we had to remove the prosthesis clean the implants and then very aggressively reshape the prosthesis so that we could get access to clean and you can see already immediate improvement and there it is there and a year follow-up showing that the bone has returned to a horizontal stable pattern and no bleeding. So again, I cannot stress enough, you must design cleansability into your prosthesis. So in summary, from part one, we know that implants are more prone, that we should be careful with our bleeding on probing and incorporating the IMI, 
Um, the radiographs need to be done properly and using a standard reference to rough surface. Periimplantitis is overestimated if you accept it's 10% and you basically are setting yourself up for failure. You should do better than that. And the risk factors are these and that's how you can avoid getting such a high number. Um, in fact, the, the real number from people that are inexperienced is probably far greater than 10%. But hopefully today you've learned all of these things that can help you avoid that. So I'm gonna, with that, stop the lecture there and thank you guys for coming. Hopefully you did enjoy this and I'll see you for part three, which is where we talk about how we treat it.